Come, let us return to the Lord, for it is he who has torn, and he will heal us. He has struck down, and he will bind us up. After two days he will receive us. On the third day he will raise us up, for we may live before him. Let us know, let us press on to know the Lord. His appearing is as sure as the dawn. He will come to us like the showers, like the spring rains that water the earth. Let us worship the King this morning by singing our first hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Take some time out of our everyday lives to be with you. 
we focus on quieter thoughts and realise how fortunate we are to have you in our lives, to personally know you as our Lord and Saviour. We are especially thankful during these uncertain times where having our faith is a constant in our lives and knowing we are able to gain strength from you. Lord, help us to trust your guiding hand to get us through each day and situations we may face. Help us to continue spreading your word, Lord, so that now more than ever people need not feel alone, but know your loving arms to them again. Hear us as we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. Good morning, everyone. As you can see, I have a vase of water and several objects with me this morning. Some of the objects I have with me will float in the water and some of them will sink. Normally I would ask the children to come out and join us at this point and take part in the children's address. However, due to the circumstances that we're in, that is not possible. But I am going to ask those adults who are taking part in the service today to participate in the address. They will have to answer whether they think the objects will sink or float. The first object I'm going to use is a sponge. So I now ask those here if they could suggest whether this will sink or float. I think it will sink. Float. I think it will no. float. I've changed my mind, it's going to float. So they think it's going to float. And indeed, it floats. And I'm going to make trouble for wetting the cloths. The next object I have is a metal spoon. Do they think this will sink? Or float. They all think it will sink. And indeed, it sinks. The two other objects I have are the same. They are corks with lids on them. However, they are slightly different in their makeup. So before I put them in, I'm going to ask the people here to suggest whether they will sink or float. The small one, do you think it will sink or float? Float. I think float. 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 And they are quite correct, it floats. What about the larger one? Float. 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 Yes. I think it will float. Aye. So do you think it will float? Yes. Float. See how wrong they can be? It sinks. The second one sank because it is much heavier than the other cork because the lid is made of metal where the other corpse lid is made of plastic. Do you think that you could float or walk on water? And if you were walking on water, would you sink? The Bible tells us that after Jesus had fed the 5,000 people with just five loaves of bread and two fish, Jesus told his disciples to get into their boats and go to the other side of the lake. Well, he went up the mountain to be alone and to pray. While the disciples were going to the other side of the lake in their boat, the wind came up and the water began to get rough. The disciples became afraid that their boat would sink and they would be drowned. Then they looked and they saw Jesus coming towards them and he was walking on the water. When Peter saw Jesus, he became excited and said to him, Lord, is that really you? Let me walk to you on the water. Jesus answered Peter and said, Come on the water. Peter climbed over the side of the boat and started walking on the water to Jesus. Then the winds grew stronger and he saw the waves and he became afraid and he started to sink. He cried out to Jesus, help, save me. Jesus reached out his hand and saved Peter and said to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt me? 
as long as Peter kept his eyes on Jesus, he was walking on the water. But when he took his eyes off Jesus, he began to sink. As we go through life, there will be many storms. We will encounter some pretty rough waters. As long as we keep our eyes upon Jesus and put our trust in him, we will be okay. But if we take our eyes off Jesus and stop following him, we will surely sink. Let us pray. Dear Jesus, when the storms of life come against us, help us to keep our eyes on you and put our trust in you. Amen. Amen. We will now continue with our service by singing him, Faithful One. He is our God. We are the people he cares for, 
the flock for which he provides. And the second reading is from Matthew chapter 14, they are reading from verse 13 to 33. Heading, Jesus feeds the great crowd. When Jesus heard the news about John, he left in the boat and went to a lonely place by himself. The people heard about it, so they left their town and followed him by land. Jesus went out of the boat when he saw the last crowd. His heart was filled with pity for them, and he healed those who were ill. That evening, the disciples came to him and said, It's already very late, and this is a lonely place. Send the people away and let them go to the village to buy food for themselves. They don't have to leave, answered Jesus. You yourself give them something to eat. All we have here are five wolves and two fish, they replied. Then bring them here to me, Jesus said. He ordered the people to sit down on the grass, and he took the five loaves and two fish, looked up to heaven, and gave thanks to God. He broke the loaves and gave to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the people. Everyone ate and had enough. The disciples took up twelve baskets full of what was left over. The number who ate was about five thousand not counting the women and the children. Jesus walks on the water. Then Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side of the lake. When he sent the people away, after sending the people away, he went up the hill by himself to pray. When evening came, Jesus was here alone. And by this time, the boat was far out in the lake, tossed about by the waves, because the wind was blowing against it. Between three and six o'clock in the morning, Jesus came to the disciples walking on the water. When they saw him walking on the water, they were terrified. It's a ghost, he said, and screamed with fear. Jesus spoke to them at once. Courage, he said. It is, I don't be afraid. Then Peter spoke up, Lord, if it is really you, order me to come out on the water to you. Come, answered Jesus. So Peter got out of the boat and started walking the water to Jesus. When he noticed a strong wind, he was afraid and started to sink down in the water. Save me, Lord, he said. Once Jesus reached out and grabbed hold of her, how little faith you have. Why did you doubt? They both got into the boat. The wind had died down. The disciples in the boat worshipped Jesus. Truly, you are the Son of God, they explained. And may I God add his blessings to the real reason of which we May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable unto thee, my Lord God, Saviour and Master. In our Bible reading this morning, we heard that amazing story about how Jesus walked on the water of the Sea of Galilee and how his disciple Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water too even if only for a few steps. It's such an incredible story that we often miss an important detail. Jesus and Peter didn't just walk across the calm surface of a lake. This miracle happened during the middle of a violent storm. Matthew 12, 24 says the the boat the disciples were on was fighting a strong headwind and was being battered by the waves. And I don't think we can really get this story without seeing the storm. The first Christians didn't just notice the storm. 
When they told this story, they imagined themselves in the boat with the disciples, dog tired and distressed, far away from the safety of the shore, with a strong wind blowing against them and the waves tossing their boat around. I think we all fall into that same category this morning in our ongoing battle with COVID-19. Let us all ride the storm this morning as we, as we wait on the man of Galilee knowing our Redeemer is at hand. These first Christians were weathering storms of their own. They were suffering persecutions. They were targeted by ruthless rulers. Their employers would fire them. Whether disaster struck, their neighbours would blame them. Sometimes their own families disowned them. So when this story was told in the first churches, they knew Jesus walking on the water wasn't just some cool trick he did to impress us. He was coming to help his friends in the storm. And they believed that Jesus would come to be with them and comfort them through their storms too. That's what the story is really about. How Jesus goes to incredible, unexpected, extraordinary lengths to be with us in the storms of life. You learn to see the story that way when you imagine yourself sitting in that storm-tossed fishing boat with those disciples like the early Christians did because it reminds us, it reminds us that we all have to weather hard storms in life. For Jesus' disciples that night, it was a literal squall on the Sea of Galilee. For the early Christians, it was persecution, harassment and rejection. My friends, we will all endure some fierce storms in our lives. It might be health problems, the death of someone we love, job loss, divorce, depression, self-isolation, COVID-19. Sometimes something totally unexpected and unforeseen just gets hurled at us that we are completely unprepared for. I do not need to remind you all of what landed on our doorstep in March 2020. Like the disciples in our story today, one minute you are sailing along, next thing you know the wind's against you, you're being battered by the waves and you can't even see the shore. Beneath our clothes, our reputations, our pretensions, beneath our religion or lack of it, we are all vulnerable both to the storm without and the storm within. What do you do when the storm comes? So what do you do when the storm comes? That night, the disciples hunkered down and kept pushing against the wind. Is that what you are supposed to do when the storm comes? Keep your head down, push forward and hope everything works out. Are you strong enough for that? Even more importantly, would Jesus tell you to do that? Jesus met people every day whose lives had been torn apart by the storms they were going through. Not once can I even remember him saying, just try harder. 
Our culture often tells us to face our storms head on with bravado. You can see this in the memes that go around in social media. Let me give you a popular example. Fate whispers to the warrior, you cannot withstand the storm. The warrior whispers back, I am the storm. Look, this sound fierce, powerful, resilient and self-reliant. This sounds fierce, powerful, resilient and self-reliant. Our culture values and encourages these traits. But scripture teaches us a very different set of values. The Bible doesn't teach us to say, I am the storm, hear me roar, see how strong I am. Instead, it teaches us to say, I will boast about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest in me or us as a body of believers. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. Listen, my good friends, every page of the Bible leads us away from bragging that we are as strong as any storm we face. Instead, it leads us to confess that the storms would surely overwhelm us, except that our Jesus is stronger than the storm. I have even heard many Christians put a spin in our culture's version, focusing on Peter. If, he, if, if he'd only had more faith, he wouldn't have started to sink. So therefore, the moral of the story, do what Peter did, or better. Fellow Christians, if this is your moral, I totally disagree with you. Why? Is this just not the same message your culture is trying to sell you? You can handle anything if you're smart enough, bold enough, loud enough, talented enough. If you believe in it, if you believe in yourself, if you get the right education or go to the right hospital or have enough money. Our sin-torn world is selling us a message that says, you can pull yourself up by your bootstraps if you'd only buy the right boots. I don't think that's what the story we heard today was trying to teach us. In fact, to me, it seems like the best example P Peter gives us in the story was when he started to sink and he cried out, Lord, rescue me. Lord, rescue me. We can't save ourselves from the storm. This storm teaches us that we can't save ourselves from the storms we face. But Jesus can, and he does, and he will. This story gives us three big truths that will shelter us, even through the fiercest storms we face in life. One, Christ comes and comforts us in the storm. Two, Christ carries us through the storm. And three, Christ is glorified through the storm. One, Christ comes and comforts us through the storm. Matthew 14, 25 to 27. Verse 25 says, Jesus came to his disciples walking on the lake. Jesus was not walking on water to look cool or to impress anyone. Jesus Christ of Nazareth did it because he knew they needed him in the storm. 
The same Jesus who left his Father's throne in heaven to become one of us walked across the water through the storm to show us that he is God with us. Jesus, our Redeemer, will come to us in our storms just as he did for his disciples. Jesus comes to us in the storm and he comforts us. Listen to what he says in verse 27. Be encouraged. I am. Don't be afraid. What was Jesus saying? Listen to this. Jesus was saying, I am God. Like we heard in our psalm reading today, which Colin read so beautifully, the mountain heights belong to him. The sea which he made is his, along with the dry ground which his hands formed. His words bring comfort because he is God. Because the seas, the dry land, all creation and all who dwell in it belong to Christ, we can find courage in any storm. After all, Jesus has already defeated the fiercest storms we face. Sin, our broken relationship with God, death itself, in his death and resurrection, Jesus came and done all this for us. So we can take comfort in our faith that Jesus will come to us whatever storm we face. Two, Jesus carries us through the storm. Matthew 14, 28 to 32. Peter wants to come to Jesus, verse 28. He didn't just think that walking on the water was a neat trick. Peter wanted to do it so he could be with Jesus. Now when Peter is afraid and begins to sink, Jesus has to grab him and carry Peter back to the boat. But it wasn't like Peter was walking on the water by his own power in the first place. Listen to this. He was only able to do it because Jesus told him he could do it. When Peter's faith was great enough that he got out of the boat and walked in those stormy waters, Jesus was carrying him. When Peter's faith was little and he started to sink, that Jesus carried him then too. This story teaches us that great faith and little faith can and do coexist in the same person. They did in Peter, and while we must have faith to be saved, you will never have enough faith to save yourself. It's Christ's faithfulness to us that saves. Our faith is often as choppy as the sea during a storm, but Christ's faithfulness to us does not change. And as our faithful Lord Jesus carries us through our storms, we will hear him say, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. They won't sweep over you. You are precious in my sight, and I love you. Isaiah 43, 1 to 4. When the storms rage around us and within us, whether our faith is strong or our faith is weak, Jesus will carry us through the storm. Christ can and will conform even a faith that is weak into a powerful witness to others when they see Jesus carrying you through the storm. Now that's a good lesson we can learn from Peter's experience. The other disciples didn't glorify Jesus because Peter's faith was perfect. No, they glorified Jesus because he saved Peter 
and stop the storm, even though their faith and Peter's faith was choppy. At our best, our faith will always be flawed. We will have times when our faith is great and time when our faith is weak. Listen to this, but Christ will always be fully faithful to carry us through every storm for his glory and your good. We learn all this when we put ourselves in the boat with those disciples, fighting against the storm, seeing Jesus walking across the crashing waves like he owned them, because he does. Because he does. Peter's deliverance and rescuer had arrived just in time, and so has ours this morning. This same Jesus, who calmed the storm, is inviting us to let him calm our fears and our storms this morning. Will you let him? Will you let him? Your personal Coast Guard has arrived and his name is Jesus. God through Jesus Christ has his big strong arms opened wide this morning. Will you follow me as I run and jump into the strong arms of my beautiful, powerful Heavenly Father? Everything is now quiet and still because the storm is over. The storm is over. In finishing, we do not have to listen to the voices that say, you'll only make it through the storm if you're strong enough, smart enough, resilient enough, telling you that you can only weather the storm by being as wild and as strong as the storm. That's the world's ways, not the Lord's ways. That same Jesus walked across the stormy waters of Lake Galilee to come to his disciples, comfort them, rescue them, and still the storm. That's a much greater true story than the world and even some well-being religious people knows how to tell. Because that story tells you and me, you can survive the storm because our Saviour Jesus is stronger than any storm and he will come to you and me, comfort you and me and carry you and me through it. Let us, as a church family, keep our eyes focused on Jesus Christ of Nazareth, who is the author and finisher of our faith. He is the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, and all that is in between. Let his name be praised, exalted, magnified, and glorified in our lives this morning. Will you take that lifeboat? Will you receive that saving hand? Will you let him come to you, walk to him, and grasp him? Let his name be praised. Glory be to the Father, glory be to the Son, Glory be to the Holy Spirit, God, free in one. Amen. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Hear us, Lord, as we come before you, thinking especially of others in our wider families, communities, country and throughout the world, who will benefit from the power of prayer. You always know what others are going through, Lord. As we place those we especially know and personally think of into your hands, we ask you bring them peace. Current situations have affected everyone's lives. We pray for those less fortunate than ourselves, those separated from loved ones, feeling lonely, 
those bereaved, dealing with grief, others with job pressures or insecurities. Facing financial struggles soothe their sorrows. Guide those in positions of leadership to work throughout these times beneficially for us all, as we, a church family, are unable to gather in person. We count our blessings, Lord, thankful for our online service, thankful for everyone participating and everyone able to watch. We place all our congregation, members, groups, committees and session into your hands and ask for your guidance as we come together in your name. Lord, Amen. To finish our service this morning, let us sing that well-known hymn that I know the congregation of Whitburn South sing so beautifully and it's so real and alive with the sermon this morning. It comes in beautifully. There is a Redeemer. Amen.